little scrape in Pakistan yeah, or something? that is another problem. Area. So when we were transporting in the first part of OEF, prisoners that we would take on the battlefield, we had a system that if they were collected in Afghanistan, we'd bring them to Bagram Air Base. Everybody knew that. There was a, a one-star Army general in charge of that whole operation. Good friend of mine uh, that had been the Delta commander was a good guy, too. And I liked him because we became friends when I was at US SOCOM with the sink because he had a special assistant job and I had a special assistant job. So he was a general, I was a colonel. So, but he still considered me a friend. So it's okay. Okay. And he had that operation. And then we'd learned that there were other prisoners in Pakistan. So the complication there was. Um, different authorities for flying into and out of Pakistan, if you well can imagine. They had mm -hmm. different rules for weapons you could bring and weapons you couldn't bring. They actually had a lot of rules. Well, okay. we were going to be compliant with all those things. But I also developed a great relationship because I was the land component commander, which was CFLIC. You know, there, there's a CFAC and there's a CFLIC. I was a ranking mm -hmm. officer at the C flick um, and developed a great relationship with the director of mobility forces at the CFAC. So in other words, the big general that was in charge of all the airlift in that theater and the inter theater work that would come from the big jets, you know, C-17, C-5s into theater. So the Dermont 4 had that responsibility. And I had to talk to the Dermont 4, even though, yes, I was a cast guy, yes, a controller, yes, airspace, yeah, all that kind of stuff. But I'm also, in the back of my mind, I, I'm a mobility guy. I spent a, lo a lot of time at MAC headquarters. I know how the airlift system works. Um, and as a combat controller, I supported nothing but airlift almost yeah, yeah, yeah so it's not as if i didn't understand any of that the Dermont four and i struck up a relationship because he knew i understood this and he understood that. and so we could talk daily because the biggest problems that we had with the c flick was not on cas or what i would call ground directed interdiction of the first part mm -hmm. it was on airlift and everybody was unhappy with airlift you know, how much do we got? When are we going to get it? We need this here. We need this here. We need this here. We need this here. So I was on the phone with Dermot Four, probably a dozen times a day, every day. Like, it never stopped. Never. Yeah. It, it, it literally never stopped. And people thought, well, I, like I'm an airlift guy. You know, so... An airlift guy actually comes in, he's a young uh, captain, and he says, um, I said, wow, uh, an Air Force guy, um, wh where do you work? He says, I work for the, uh, I work for the four, you know, the log eight guy, the Army Colonel. I said, well, what are you working on? Um, he says, I'm working on a briefing that explains how the Air Force is not meeting the airlift requirement for the Army. I said, say that one more time. You're working on what briefing? You're working on a briefing. I mean, I'm answering questions a dozen times a day. You're working on a briefing that says the Air Force is not supporting the Army? Oh, yes. I said, hmm. <laughs> well, Captain, <laughs> stop working on that now. That's an order. <laughs> Have the courtesy of going to that Army colonel and saying, Colonel Longoria, that Air Force guy over there says, I don't work for you. And that I have to leave this office right now and go to his office. I'm going to tell him that. I said, now I'll tell him. But you go do that. So before I did that, I called Dermot Four. I said, and he goes, what? 
what did you do? And he goes, I said, I did what I just said. And he goes, oh, that's great. That's exactly that. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. So we really developed a really good relationship on what my role was going to be at that land component headquarters. Uh -huh. Because that's why I said I had multiple bosses when a boss would want me. So I was the 18th um, Corps Commander's ALO. Okay. I worked for the CFAC in war. Ninth Air Force Commander on paper back home. Yeah. By order, I was assigned to be the liaison to the land component commander army which is third army back home so okay. third army commander land component commander the 18th airborne corps commander the cfac the ninth air force commander back home and <laughs> the soft three star because my soft tac p supported rangers and special forces right right i was a senior guy so when i put this on a briefing slide <laughs> i have three army three-star bosses one air force three-star boss i mean that's at a minimum so that's yeah, yeah. four three-star bosses and anybody asks me hey the boss is calling i'd have to ask them, yeah it's like <laughs> which boss tell me which boss right right but the long and short of that, I had a great working relationship with the Dermob 4. He knew I understood the airlift system. And at the time, we actually had 18th Air Force, which is the operating arm of the military airlift command. You know, I mean, it's everything yeah. revolves around that. We didn't have 21st or 22nd anymore. They were different entities. It was the 18th Air Force. So I understood the airlift system. Uh, and he could confine him. And so when I gave him a heads up that we had prisoners in Pakistan, he goes, oh, shit. He says, well, I'm going to have to put crews against that to go pick them up in Pakistan, transport them across the country dividing line between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and fly them into Bagram and so that they could be put into the facility where we uh, talked to them. All right. Um, and he said, uh, I, I don't know if I have any crews that can transport that because I said, it's actually a difficult task. I uh, just want to think about the task. The first, and I said, because I was telling him, he says, how do you know? I says, oh, so I've been doing this for a long time. He says, okay. I said, you will get these prisoners. They will be of all ages, shapes and sizes. They will all be in man dresses. And mm -hmm. they will shit and piss all the way up to the airplane, in the airplane, back off the airplane. You are responsible for floor loading this, I'm assured, because we have protocols for how to floor load them. I said, but if there's an aircraft yeah. emergency or anything, I mean, I'm walking him through all of the difficulties in planning. He goes, oh, my God. <laughs> he goes, go meet those crews. Give them as much sensitivity training, not sensitivity training, but make them as sensitive to these issues as possible. Tell them the best protocols yeah. to use for safety of aircraft, safety of the passengers for emergency purposes, et cetera. You, you got it. The crews have to fly all the right flight plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything has to be deconflicted in the AOC. I said, yeah, yeah, we got that. He says, can you do that? I go, yeah, I, we're not, so, okay. So he got me a C-21. It lands in Kuwait, picks me up, takes me down to Seab. That's where the, uh, the C-130 crews are. So I okay. brief them, everything like this. But the problem is I have to leave my long gun, there, my AR-15, my GAL-5, basically. Right. And I was supposed to leave my pistol. I said, I'm not going, I'm not going into combat without something to shoot at the people. I'm, no, right. So I had to leave that there. 
and I hit my uh, pistol and we fly into Mark. Pakistan and the prisoners are not there. Now we have liaison officers that are working at high levels. There was a general, a one star and um, an Air Force major, I think. And so I, wa I, I went to them and they said, we don't, we don't, we don't know where they are. I said, well, this was supposed to be, you know, a simple transload. Yeah. Get them in the airplane, wrap them up. Everybody safe. Yep, yep. The flight to Bagram is an hour, if that. I mean, it's not long. Yeah. Mission done, over with, complete. Crews go home. I go back. You know, everything. It's done. It's 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 done. Okay. Yeah, Nothing yeah. ever works that way. And so my problem was I did exactly what I said I never would do. Um, I was a group commander. Uh, and I was by myself. Now, I don't mean alone like, I, I mean, I was alone in that no one worked for me. Negotiate with the aircraft commander where I think you need to do this. And, you know, I didn't want to keep saying to the aircraft commander, Hey, you want me to call the Dermop 4? You know, I, I, mean, I could have done that. That's just not the way I, just not the way I, I do anything. You know, I explain to people sure, sure. what we got to do, why we got to do it, why it's important. And I go, what authorities do you need? If you don't have some authority, I will get you some authority to do something. Like Dermot Ford says, you, we need to take off with him <laughs> uh, two hours. Okay, so how can I now help you? And talk, work with the load masters and all those kinds. Yeah, yeah. And I got the cops assigned to the crew. Their job, and as I told them, your job, you only have one job, protect that air crew at all costs. Someone, anyone comes towards the cabin, shoot them. Deadly force is authorized. No discussion, no nothing. I don't care who it is. You protect the crew at all costs. And that was the MAC protocol. It's not yeah. a, you know, it's a very simple protocol. Now, you still have to worry about safety of flight issues and all those other kinds. Of things. All right, so the air crew commanders were good. It's not that they weren't, you know, but I had to explain each time. But nobody worked for me. Like, <laughs> no one worked for me. Uh, my staff did back at the Seaflake headquarters, and they were battle tracking me. Where are you now? So, you know, and I, I would... Now I'm in C. Now, now, now you're going to Pakistan. Oh, the commander's in Pakistan. I, you know, and they would have to brief the land component commander, you know, where I was because I actually worked. Through. Yeah. Where's LA now? You know, you know, where's Waldo? Uh, kind of thing. Uh, but the prisoners were not there. I had no idea. I had no intelligence. I had no idea where they were. I, I hadn't thought. Oh my god. And to be honest with you, I hadn't thought. I hadn't thought through that. Never expected to be in that situation. Yeah, it didn't dawn you they wouldn't be there. They were supposed to be there. So I mean, I, I didn't expect it. It just um, – yeah. so I go, okay. And I asked this Air Force major – I wish I could remember his name. But anyway, he's a good guy. I said, can I go there? He goes, I don't know. I go, you don't know? <laughs> I said, so who – I said, who – just show me the Pakistani Army, Air Force – who do I need to talk to to see if I can get to the prisoners? Because I'm going to get these prisoners back to this airplane and I want to get out of here. And we find a Pakistani army guy and goes, uh, oh, yeah, uh, I'll drive you. <laughs> I go, this is wonderful. Just ask questions and you get, <laughs> uh, you get answers. Yeah. <laughs> so now the major doesn't come with me because uh, – he goes, no, we don't really go out. We, uh, we have to stay here. I said, well, whatever. Uh -huh. So I get in the car and I go, great, let's go. Ah, once again, no intelligence brief. I'm not, I am, I'm embarrassed to say that for a while I really didn't know what I was. I said, I'm now traveling with a Pakistani army uh, in a vehicle. I'm going to go to prisoners. I have no idea where I am. Where I'm going, I know where I just came from, the airfield, so I think I can make it back here. Um, but that's about it. 
And I started thinking oh, about that as I was God. getting to this location. Oh, man, <laughs> I really hope, I really hope nothing happens. I can, I can yeah. honestly say I really said that to myself. I really hope because nothing's going to happen. Um, yeah. The Pakistanis yeah. have control. This is about 17 miles, maybe 20, 17, 20 miles from Peshawar. Okay. And that was okay. a bad location. True. Yeah. But um, the airfield was secure. Everything was secure around it. And, you know, don't worry. Why wouldn't this be secure? <laughs> yeah. And um, we got there. No events. I said, you see, I'm telling myself, I, I worried about nothing. I'm like a, I'm like a silly little weenie ass, you know, worried about stuff. For even thinking of it, yeah. For even worrying it about hasn't it. hasn't happened. God. I'm glad nobody was with me that could tell them that I was worried about, it. you know, it's like, man, I'm glad I don't have right, to admit right. that to anybody ever again. So, um, and they have what is, it's not a yellow school bus. Okay, it is a bus uh, that I think was a school bus, but it's it's white. It's a white bus. It's very easy to see. Is my <laughs> and all the prisoners were in that bus and another vehicle. Um, I don't know exactly what it was. It wasn't a, an APC or anything like that. It wasn't a tactical vehicle, but another vehicle and and our vehicle. And we were going back, you know, 20 minutes to get to the damn airport, or oh, maybe 30 minutes, okay, to get back to the airfield. Yeah. Simple. Then all hell broke loose. And the sniper must have been pretty good because he got the driver of the uh, bus like, I think it was the first shot. Now, I didn't see that. I, I, I mean, arguably, I put that together after, you know, after I talked to people and after we got through the incident. But there was this other lead vehicle, um, the bus, and then we were behind. We were number three. Arguably, you know, the safest position. That's okay. Marini, I was in the safest position. But... Everybody else was Pakistani right, right. or or a prisoner. Um, okay. Now it's the only American. So the bus then, it, you know, and it, and it hits some kind of bump or something, and boom, it falls over. And we go, holy shit. And then <laughs> we hear a lot more shots, and I go, I'm not going to start shooting at someone with a pistol that has a rifle. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll wait. I'll, You're just giving away your I'll position at that point. Yeah. A little bit more of the situation, but I'm not just going to start shooting my pistol. I mean, it's, sure, sure. it's just not going to happen with me. I, I'd rather wait, right. try to figure out what I'm up against a little bit. Or maybe there's a little running yeah. involved or a little uh, more hiding or whatever. I will use the pistol. I don't, right. I don't mind you doing that. But so uh, the good thing is this guy had two AK-47s in the vehicle we were with. Nice. I said, can I use it? Yep. I go, okay. I never imagined myself. Am I actually going to fire an AK-47 in actual uh, combat? Never, never thought I would actually do that. I mean, it just came yeah. across my mind. Um, and I didn't know where the snipers, I, I had no idea where they were coming from. I, I know they were, you know, like north of our position, but, and not behind us. Everything was, you know, kind of up front, but I, I, right. I couldn't tell. I had no idea. Uh, the the lead Pakistani, not us, I didn't have a radio, the lead Pakistani had called for support and two Pakistani helicopters would come 
Uh, they would shoot at some stuff. I have no idea if they were effective or not. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I, I have no clue. I, I never talked to them, never coordinated anything. And I just said, how in the hell are we going to get these guys to that airplane? I said, I'm not going to use helicopters because I can't even talk to them. In a different language. I don't even know if I can pull this off. All right. So that happens. And then some are getting out of the bus. They're starting to get out of the bus. A couple of the prisoners are actually shy. I go, oh, my God. Now, who would be shooting the prisoners to? Like, yeah, like, what was the purpose of the guy in the first place you know, it, to it, shoot? I really had no essay of what I, I could I could see things, but I really had no understanding of my little battle area at that point in time. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever felt. Uh, Sounds crazy. Part of Panama was a little like that. But so there are a couple of dead prisoners, and I assumed they were dead. I just, you know, uh, we would walk over them. Uh, we would get to the front with my Pakistani colonel, uh, and we'd go, he said, well, uh, we're getting another bus. Well, well they're going to be, <laughs> they're going to be in the same <laughs> situation. So I said, okay, are you up for this? I'm up for it. Okay. Locked load. We know they're up there somewhere. Let these guys sort it out. I don't have time to find the prisoners right now. We got to go take these guys out. I mean, who else is going to do it? All right. So he didn't want to. And then I get another Pakistani that comes from the other vehicle. So now you got three of us. And we just start spraying the shit out of this. <laughs> it wasn't a ridge line. It was like a little ridge line, but, you know, kind of rocky. And um, we don't know if we were hitting. I mean, literally, I don't know if we were hitting anything at all. Yeah, yeah. But it was suppressive enough that we weren't getting shot at. For sure. And so I started to see another bus coming. Uh, and helicopters kept flying over. And so I asked them, I said, can those helicopters put any kind of fire on that ridge? Can they put any kind of fire on that ridge line? Because if they can con constantly put fire on that ridge line, I think we have time to transport these prisoners. Some of them are dead, by the way. We started out with, I think, 27 or whatever, and we worked our way down to 18. Um, so, but we didn't do it. We, 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 we did not shoot the prisoners. Right, right. Um, Apparently they shot their own guys for some reason. I mean, it was and, weird. And so we were doing this transload, and then I actually saw people. I actually felt more comfortable for the first time. Tell the other guy, I said, we can get those guys. We got them. Let them get closer. They're, they're I, you know, I don't know why they didn't have a great... They, they obviously had a great sniper position. Why would they move? I don't know why they would move. Are there different people? I have no idea. But there wasn't a lot of gunfire, but there was enough to keep everybody's head down. Like four or five shots every minute kind of thing. Okay. But it wasn't intense except that little act that we pulled to just shoot the shit out of them. rocks that <laughs> we had no idea if people were there or not. I mean, we didn't. Right, right. Right. And to get closer, and I popped them. And because I was the only one <laughs> wanting to shoot up there. But I saw them close enough, and I got now. I'm not saying I individually tapped them, I sprayed them, and I know I got because they went down. And there was no shooting after that. None. Wow. So we get all these prisoners back in the bus, and we get back to the airfield. And I see the major, and then this uh, one star, general, comes out. I go, sir, I'll have to give it to you in a debrief. Um, can I get these prisoners to Bagram, like right now? Because I got general, the Dermot 4 is wanting to know what the heck goes on. So I'll give you a debrief later. Yeah. It's okay. So we get back to Bagram, and I think nothing of it. 
because I go, okay, it's just over. And, you know, I, I didn't want to think about it, frankly. Yeah, yeah. So that general took my report that I gave him a couple of days later. And he put me in for a, a decoration, which I didn't ask for. I didn't want. I wanted to forget about it, frankly, because uh, yeah. I didn't think I did anything that warranted a medal. I mean, frankly, I didn't think I did. Oh, uh, um, I do. I think I was thinking you deserve more than that. I mean, you you essentially saved everybody there. I mean, nobody. You were the only one willing to act. Well, I mean, know, I had buddies kind of took charge that, of the whole situation. That, that shot along with me, and to this day, I don't know okay. how many enemy per se there were. I I don't know. I know at least two of them are dead. I know that. Yeah. yeah. That because I saw that, and I witnessed that. So I don't know, but um, I didn't even tell my staff, uh, you know, because I go, I was violating my rule never to be without anybody in my, you know, yeah. what, you know. Um, now I'm happy. It's just like uh, uh, I'm uh, blessed with, you know, that that general didn't have to do that. Uh, nobody there had to support. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, nobody had to. Nobody had to do any of that. Yeah. You know, I mean, and we didn't plan any of it. 